Um, so, uh, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Dave Hammer, the Executive Director of the ICA Group. Um, unfortunately, before we get started, um, there's some like logistical stuff we need to work on. So, apparently there was a, like a water main break at the restaurant. We need to come up with a different alternative to what we're doing. So I just wanna, we, what we wanted to do is sort of just get some ideas from folks about what we might be able to do in that. So um, I know it's like kind of like, like last minute and just, but it just, does anybody have any ideas around like kind of, you know, we're, we're really thinking out of the box here. What do we wanna think about in terms of what we might do? So just, I'm gonna start calling on tables to sort of get an idea. So um, any, this, You want to go find a Mexican restaurant? Well, so the pro okay, so the problem, so the, the idea is trying to find a Mexican restaurant. The problem is we might not be able to make a reservation for all this bigger group of people. So we're trying to think about, that's part of the challenge we need to think about. Um, what's that one? We could cook? Right, so who's got, who's got like a kitchenette in the room? Can we do that? Right. Um, any other ideas? Order delivery. How about in the back over here? A food truck, we could try to find a food truck to come out. Right. Okay. Um, so so this, is a, this is a little bit, this is a little bit hard, this is a hard decision to do. So I think what we're gonna do is we're just gonna sort of, like we're, we're like all these big problems, we're gonna turn it over to Kirstie, she'll make the decision, she'll figure it out. Um, uh, um, so so there's, there's not a water main break. Um, uh, that was all a lie. Um, but it was, what I'm hoping was an example of um, the sort of the, the, the challenges and the interest of, of sort of group, big group decision making. Um, so when we talk about kind of big group decision making, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, why do we care about participatory decision making? Why do we care about getting everybody's voice? And it comes back, I think, to the fundamental thing we're talking about with cooperatives, which is there is real truth in every single person's existence. Part of the truth exists in everyone. And what cooperatives do is we share that power, we share that truth amongst those workers. And if we wanna make wise decisions, if we wanna make the best decisions, we wanna figure out how to pull that truth from everyone, right? Um, but that can be difficult, right? So I'm not sure who said uh, we should cook, right? We'll do, we'll, 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 we'll cook. But when, when that came out, did anybody think like, oh, that's a, you know, that's a wacky, crazy idea? Or, right, like, so we come up with these different ideas, right? And it's from a different perspective and it can really kind of, you know, it can make it, it can make it difficult. We can, it, so, so those are real challenges, right? Um, and we need tools to figure out how to pull that stuff out and find that real truth. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so group decisions are easy if the solution is obvious, right? Um, so what we're gonna do here is, um, kind of map out a little bit of like what a group decision, you know, what a decision might look like. So here in the corner here, you've got this idea of a, a, a new topic. Here's an idea, right? Where do we go to rest, where, you know, water main broke, where do we go? Um, but maybe this is a simple solution, right? So it's a, it, we've got this, you know, we've got this issue here. When we're talking about this, we have these sort of diversity of ideas, right? So you have an idea, right? So we had this idea of like, um, uh, you know, we need to find a new restaurant. It was like, oh, let's go to a new restaurant. We've got to find a Mexican restaurant. Hey, let's bring in a food truck. There's, you know, let's have everybody cook, right? There's a lot of diversity of ideas, right? Simple solutions, and then there's time, right? And it takes time. We have to have, take, spend time to have this meeting. So it's like a graph of what a decision might look like. Um, if it's simple, you get to these familiar Ideas, you get like, you know, so each of these little circles is an idea, right? If it's a simple solution, if it's an obvious solution, then that, you know, the diversity of ideas that, you know, that the options don't change that much and it doesn't take that much time, right? And then you come up with an obvious solution, right? And this is kind of like, oh yeah, this is how we do it. But the idea, the problem you run into is when you have, when you're talking about something important and big, 
right? When you're talking about sort of a fundamental thing for a business or for the co-op, you get these sort of initial conversations. They're simple, they're sort of straightforward, they're, um, but not every solution has an obvious, not every uh, problem has an obvious solution. And so coming up with like how to unpack that, that piece is it takes time. Um, and so as time goes on, when there's not an obvious solution, as time goes on, what happens is the ideas start getting wackier and, and different, and some of those ideas, you're like, that's a terrible idea. And some of those ideas are like, I don't understand what that, you know, what that is. And so as you move through this process, it can feel really challenging, right? So this idea of like difficult, you know, difficult solutions can really only be solved when we explore a wide range, right? And we actually, in order to resolve the, some of those differences or misunderstandings, right, that can lead to frustration. So who's been in a meeting, a big meeting, group meeting, where you've sort of, somebody has said something, an idea or, an, or something, where you felt like, that doesn't make sense, and you kind of got angry about it. You were frustrated with what with, with somebody said in a meeting. Hands up. Right? And then keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, who, in the course of that meeting, figured out like, oh, that's what they re this is not every time, but one time, that you figured out like what they really were talking about, and you said, oh, I kind of understand what they're getting, I know where they're coming from, and it makes more sense. Who has, who's, who's had that? Lower your hand if that's happened. All right, I feel bad for the people who've never had that, who've always been frustrated. I'm sorry about that. But you go through this process, Right? And it's like only through an exploration of these different ideas, only through an exploration of this variety of stuff can you come up with the sort of all these, you know, pieces of the truth. But inevitably that's gonna lead to frustration and confusion and disagreement, right? And we, as a society, we wanna tell each other that disagreement and conflict and confusion and frustration, that's bad and must be avoided, right? Now the idea generally, right, this is sort of like an idealized process, is that you'll go through this process of like a new idea and you'll start doing what they call divergent thinking. That's sort of like brainstorming, it's coming up with different ideas, it's sort of where the ideas are, are diverging, they're changing. And then you go through a process and you go has, start like consolidating and you know, it's convergent and then you come up with this wonderful, amazing decision, right? So this is what we think of as like how a decision kind of should work. Right? And this is really important, right? So we have to go through a process of, of thinking about you know, kind of, you know, different kind of thinking, right? So divergent thinking, that's generating alternatives. Divergent thinking is like a free-flowing discussion, right? Getting the juices flowing, right? It's gathering diverse viewpoints, and it's suspending judgment, right? If everybody's ever done a brainstorming session, right? There's no bad ideas in a brainstorming session. But then when you start looking at them, sometimes like there are bad ideas, and so you have to exercise judgment, right? And so you go through that change of like divergent thinking of suspending judgment to convergent thinking of exercising judgment, right? So you have to go through this process of like, let's pull out ideas, and then let's get to this thing. And so the idea here is like, oh, we, you know, this is how groups make decisions, we'll get together, we'll have a meeting, we'll talk about it, and we'll go from this new topic not an obvious solution, but we'll do this brainstorming exercise and then we'll come together with a you know, collective decision and come up with this amazing, wonderful decision, right? And we'll, you know, we'll do that and it'll be easy. Who believes that, <laughs> right? Group decisions are hard and group decisions are hard because there's this piece that's missing. There's something in the middle. Um, and what's missing is what's called the groan zone. Right? So this is, I'm giving all credit to, there's this fantastic book called The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. The main author is this guy, Sam um, uh, Kanner. It's a great book. If you are running big meetings, you should buy this book. Um, there's a digital version, there's a, a print version. It's a great book. This is where this comes from. So when you have this, you know, you kind of go through this divergent zone, right, where you're kind of figuring out, like, what are the different ideas Right? How do we identify these different things? And then you get to the convergence zone where you're kind of exercising judgment, making the best choice. But what we forget about is there's this middle place called the groan zone. That's where you get pissed off at the person next to you who says like 
something that you think is just nuts. That's where somebody says something where you're confused. That's where you, you know, where somebody says like, I think it should be blue. And somebody says like, it should definitely be green. You get these differences, right? That's normal. Um, and it's a necessary part of what we do in terms of making decisions, right? So a key takeaway from this, in group decision making, discomfort does not equal dysfunction. I've been in dozens and dozens and dozens of rooms where people are like, this is a dysfunctional group because there's disagreement. Disagreement doesn't necessarily mean dysfunction. Disagreement just means that you're pulling out po components of that truth, right? You're pulling out different pieces of it. And if we can work through that grown zone, if we can facilitate ourselves through that grown zone, then we can figure out how to make that discomfort generative, powerful, make us stronger, right? Um, miscommunications, misunderstanding, this is a normal part of things, right? People are coming up with an idea, they're putting out an idea, it's not fully thought out, and somebody hears it for the first time and they're misunderstanding it, that's normal, that's part of this decision, right? But oftentimes if you're like, you know, oh, that was a really hard meeting, it was just, you know, I got disagreed, like, you can disagree with people, um, but that doesn't mean that you're, um, you know, like, I mean, sometimes you disagree with people because you're fighting, right? But if you're trying to come up with something together, right, that disagreement really is an opportunity, right? Um, the, the key thing here is if you want key, like, really sustainable agreements, you need to work through this grown zone. And the bigger you get, the more difficult and more or more challenging it is to work through that process. Um, so key setup here is any time we're having a big decision, right, whether it's a group of five workers who are starting a, work, you know, starting a co-op, whether it's 2,000 workers who are owners of a co-op who are trying to make a decision, right, we're gonna go through this process and it's gonna be tricky, it's gonna be difficult. Um, and if we do it without thinking about it, we're gonna mess up and it's gonna be difficult. Right? So what we need to do is we need to think about facilitation. And that's really what the idea here is, is we need a facilitator. We need someone to help facilitate this conver like these conversations and help us move through this process. Right? So these are kind of some of the key roles of a facilitator. Right? It's getting people to think in public. Right? Um, there's oftentimes, you know, we'll be in a room, you know, you'll be in a room and somebody who's really quiet doesn't say anything. Right? They're not thinking in public. They're thinking privately. The person who's quiet isn't not thinking, isn't not, I mean, maybe they are, but most of the time, the people who are quiet, right, they've got really great things to say, they're just not saying them, right? You need to create a system to pull those ideas out, right? And that could be a situation where you don't say like, who's got an idea here? But rather you go around and you say, everybody's gotta say what they're gonna say. Everybody's gotta have a, a, a way to, you know, has to say something. Right? And you can pass, you can say like, oh, I'm gonna pass, but you don't sort of like popcorn, who's got something to say? You make everybody say something, right? That's a way to pull out ideas, getting people to think in public. Um, it also helps you understand each other, right? This idea of mutual understanding. Dis like, so much of disagreement in co-ops is not based on actual disagreement, but rather on misunderstanding, right? Um, and getting people to understand where you're coming from and how to move through that process. Um, the other kind of thing, though, that the, that the facilitator has to do, right, is they have to, this is this idea of, like, looking out for and interrupting oppressive behaviors, right? There are people who dominate, um, you know, they're like loudmouth people in the world, right? Like, I'm one of those people, and you need to slow those people down, right? Um, because they can dominate too much, right? There are people who engage in, you know, uh, misogynistic or, um, uh, you know, racist or, uh, you know, behaviors, those things need to be, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, tamped down. They need to be, like, slowed down, right? They need to be stopped, right? A facilitative process is how you do that. So facilitating meeting is really, really a critical skill. If you want to get these sort of wise, inclusive decisions, facilitation is a really key role. Um, and I think the other key thing here, 
And this is probably one of the biggest pieces, is this cultivating shared responsibility, right? Um, if we made a decision to do something, and it's just decided on, you know, by the, you know, the boss, or by, you know, the chairperson, or by, you know, whoever's in charge, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has bought into that decision. And if, if you don't want to do something, if you think something is stupid, or a waste of time, or a bad idea, how much energy do you put into it? Not much. But if you're bought into something, do you want to put your energy, if it's, if it's, if it's a decision that, you, that you, you own, that's your decision, how much energy do you want to put into it? A lot of it. So we, like, the idea, like, people will say, like, you waste time having these long meetings talking through process. The alternative is you can waste a lot of time by having really short meetings and then having a bunch of people drag their feet for months while you don't do anything about it, right? Um, figuring out that balance is really a trick. Um, uh, so this is kind of the, the, the like some of the, the conceptual piece. The other thing I'll sort of stress here is when we have meetings, anytime you have a meeting, a really important question you have to ask yourself is why are we here? And if you don't know, that's the question to ask. Every meeting needs a purpose, it needs an objective, right? Because um, otherwise, you can, you know, um, you're just wasting time, right? So think about what that, the purpose of that is, but there's different purposes for different meetings, different objectives for different meetings, right? So sometimes there's a meeting where we're sharing information. That's what I'm doing right now. This is me kind of like sharing information, right? Putting stuff out into the world. Other times we're brainstorming ideas, right? Where we're kind of generating stuff and that's really, you know, that's facilitating and getting that stuff. Sometimes we're figuring out like, what are the next steps? How do we, how do we make, you know, how do, what are we gonna do next around these things? So you've got all of these different kind of, you know, uh, kinds of, of, of objectives, how you facilitate the meeting is really different, right? If you're trying to brainstorm ideas and you're facilitating the meeting using a PowerPoint presentation, you're probably doing it wrong, right? Because PowerPoint is about putting information out, it's not about pulling information in, right? If you're trying to prioritize the next steps and you're giving people the information at the beginning of the meeting, and then being like, all right, let's look at this and, you know, and then start making a decision, and they haven't had time to process it, right? you're probably facilitating that meeting wrong because some people, they need to read something, they need to inter like, like think on it, sit on it, spend some time on it. right? So you might have a person where the best idea right, of the next step is somebody who needs to read something and sit on it for a little bit, and that person has the best idea in their head. right? But you give it to them three minutes before the meeting, say, read it, and then let's make a decision. And that person is like, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. But then tomorrow, they're going to come up with like the game-changing idea. But you didn't facilitate the meeting in a way that helped pull that stuff out. So really thinking about what is your objective, and given what your objective is, what are the tools you're going to use to pull that out? right? Um, so we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about like some of the mechanics, right? And how we think about um, uh, some decision making. Um, so I'm gonna talk about kind of four different mechanics of decision making, and then we're gonna spend most of our time trying to unpack one of them, which I think is a really powerful one for cooperatives. Um, so the first uh, one is, is delegation, right? So I delegated the decision of where to go to dinner to Kirsty, right? Why do I get to delegate the decision? Right? I have no authority to do that, right? Like, I didn't plan this conference. Like, I just showed up, right? Like, a lot of my staff helped plan this conference, right? But, the, the, like, I'm not the person who's sort of making that decision, right? So delegation is a really important part of how we think about kind of getting stuff done in cooperatives. But I think we really have to ask the question, who has the authority? Who's making the decision to delegate? And do they have the authority to do that? Right? A lot of times, in a cooperative, the manager will delegate a decision to an, a staff person that's really around policy stuff. Well, that manager doesn't really have the authority to make that decision. Right? Policy is the realm of the, the board and the membership. Right? So we're, we're delegating this, like, 
this thing to this person, but we're really not, you know, we're not really not giving it to that person. So delegation is really critical. It's important. It's a necessary part of being efficient, right? We can't make all of our decisions, you know, in a big circle, because then we just spend all of our time making decisions. So delegation is really critical, but let's really evaluate who's being delegated and who's getting delegated to and where they're getting delegated from. Um, is it the membership delegating to the man to, to, to a board member, or is it a manager delegating? And you know, what's that? What's that? What's the role there? Um, another one is majority rule. So oftentimes people think about majority rule and they're like, "That's what democracy is, right?" Uh, majority rule is like six people want it this way, five people want it this way, so the six people are right. Who we'll win? And then there's some decisions where it's like, oh, no, no, you need more than just six, five. You need a supermajority. You need two thirds of the people to, to vote for it or three quarters of the people to vote for it, right? Those are really important and wonderful decision making tools, right? But if they're oftentimes, they're not necessarily the, the decision that gets the, all the buy in, right? And if you make a decision, that's a majority decision, and the people who are opposed to it are like really opposed to it, then things can really grind to a halt, right? This is why you know, our government doesn't do anything for workers, is because the people who are like opposed to actually doing things from workers, they drag their feet, right? Um, and they can, slow thing, you know, they can slow things down, right? When people who are anti-worker can slow things down, that means we don't make the change, right? And we're sort of stuck with this in the, in the government, but we're not necessarily stuck with this in our co-ops, right? We get to make these decisions. Um, and democracy or majority rule, like sometimes the law says this is majority rule, and they, like they, you have to have it that way, and sometimes having majority rule is absolutely the right decision, right? Um, uh, this is this guy um, who I'm going to, I, I won't even say his name because I'm going to uh, I'll slaughter the, tran the pronunciation, um, but this, uh, this um, Dutch educator and democratic theorist who um, uh, kind of uh, identified the, um, the framework for what's called sociocracy, which is a kind of a, a rules-based collective decision-making. Um, and he really put this idea of like, if you really want to build a world in which people care for each other, you need to put aside the idea that it's like the, the, the small group will make the decision for, or the, you know, the, the majority will make the decision for the, for the whole, that you really need to like sort of figure out how to build that decision you know, together so you have this collective buy-in. Is that hard? Yeah, right? Um, and sometimes when you're in a fight with somebody, right, because they are people who want to like take power away from workers, you might not want to try to build consensus or, or you know, agreement with those folks because they are your, like, those are an adversary. But in the co-op, we shouldn't be adversaries, right? We are, like, we are working towards something together, right? So finding the balance of, like, how we think about, like, uh, majority rule in that way matters. Um, now, so a lot of people talk about consensus, like, oh, consensus, that's how co-ops do it. The problem with consensus is, like, this is one person stops it, right? So in some ways, like consensus can be like a tyranny of an individual, like one person can, can stop something, right? Um, and maybe that's an important you know, process and people you know, are bought into and this is what they want to do, right? But it's a risk, right? Where if everybody has to agree to move forward, then you've got this situation where um, you know, one person can really slow things down, right? Um, and I've been part of meetings that are based around consensus where there was somebody who was like, really, you know, really kind of undermining the whole process and it was really painful for everyone and that moved people to go away and to leave and, and that was really undermining sort of our collective efforts, right? So this was like, you know, it's like this idea of like, oh, consensus is the best way, everybody's on board, but in this situation, this per per actual practical application, it really, you know, harmed folks. Um, so I'm gonna propose this idea of consent. Right, and we're going to talk a little bit about. <laughs> um, and the idea of consent is it's kind of a merging of a lot of these things, right? And it's not necessarily the right choice for every decision in your co-op, and it's not necessarily the right choice for every co-op. Um, but I think it's a really interesting and, and, and innovative way 
um, to kind of, you know, try, to try to achieve these. And this is really simply, it's a situation where no one objects. You don't necessarily agree, right, but you don't object. Um, uh, and that, that mindset, that slight difference of do we agree or do I just not object is a really important one, right? Um, now, objections, they need to be, um, hold on, I think, right. So with consent, the idea here is it's trying to shift the power dynamics in a decision-making process away from a faction or an individual or you know, one person to kind of the arguments in the room, right? It's really trying to take the, the, um, uh, the, the ideas and have that be the, you know, like really put the ideas, you know, the, the, the power into those ideas. Um, and one of the ways it does this is it, um, oh, we're gonna go back. Um, one of the ways it does this is if you object, right, if you object to something, part of the role in consent is you have to have a reason for the objection, right? You have to have a reason for, for why you're objecting, right? Um, now, at those re there can be lots of reasons, right? Some of those reasons will be emotional. Some of those reasons will be highly logical, and some will be sort of in between, right? But you have to have a reason to object. Um, uh, the other key thing, and this is maybe the most important thing around consent, is that objections are not obstacles. Objections are learning points to understand the real truth, right? So it's the same way that like that group decision making, going through that groan zone, right? It can feel unpleasant, it can feel difficult, it can feel challenging, but if it's, you're actually going through it, right? You're actually gonna unearth some of the real, like, real truth, right? And that's what objections, that, that's what objections can be. So we're gonna sort of talk about a little bit how consent can work. Um, so consent is basically around sort of like there's three spheres, right? So the first is like your preference. This is what you want, right? Um, so I want a preference. This is what I want to have happen, right? Um, then there's this next level, which is your range of tolerance, right? This is everything that someone can work with. So it includes what they want, includes their preference, but it also includes the stuff that they're okay with. And then there's stuff that's outside of their range of tolerance, which is an objection, right? Um, and really key things, objections, not bad. Objections are reasoned, right? So it makes people to think, engage around the conversation, engage around the thing. They're incredibly valuable information, right? When somebody says, like, I don't want to do this because, for whatever reason, that is really valuable information for us to be able to unearth, like, what's really going on here, right? They can help us focus on the real, the real issue, um, and they could be a beginning of a process, right? And the great thing about consent is that um, consent is kind of like you're trying it on, right? You're not saying this is the decision forever and always. You're trying it on. How does it fit? How does it feel? Oh, and then after a day, you might be like, this feels really uncomfortable, right? And then you come back, you can come back to it, right? Because you have to evaluate your decisions in this process. Um, so this is kind of a, an illustration of what consent can kind of look like and why we think it's a, a really powerful one. So imagine if you're, um, for you this thing is like that, like, Darker little oval is your preference. That's what you want, right? And the bigger circle is, or the bigger oval is your range of tolerance, stuff that you're okay with. You're not, you don't object to, right? But then you've got another person, and their range of tolerance and their objection is, you know, is different, right? Um, then you've got a third person, theirs is also different. Well, let's look at the map here. That little circle, or that little whatever, rounded triangle, that's their shared preference. That's, if you want to get consensus, it needs to be in there. Look at this big rounded rectangle or whatever. That's the shared range of tolerance, right? It's a much bigger space. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to move forward. It allows you to make a decision that's inside that range of tolerance, move forward, figure out, is this right, and come back. 
and revisit it, right? It can take hours to get into that, you know, a finely defined thing that's inside that little sort of shared preference. But you can move through the, the, uh, the objection process a lot faster, right? So what we think about in terms of consent is that it's an opportunity to, like, pull in all of these decisions without really, you know, slowing it down into the muck of um, having, you know, hours and hours and hours of, 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 of decision making, right? And that's what oftentimes people will, um, we are talking about this uh, um, uh, last night, you can kind of, you know, you can be in these rooms where the decision is just, you know, takes like, it just drag on and on and on forever. And who in this room likes to spend more than like, you know, three hours in a meeting talking about like a particular thing? Like very few people are like, oh, that's how I want to spend my time, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, I kind of, as a job, my, my job is like to attend meetings, right? Like that's unfortunately what I've signed up to. But like most people, like they don't want to go to meetings as their job, right? That's like meetings are things to be avoided, not things to be embraced. Um, how do we make our meetings effective and move forward? Um, so here's a basic roadmap of how consent works. Um, I'm gonna lay this out, and you're gonna say, oh, that makes sense. And then you're gonna think about it for a minute, and you're gonna be like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. And we'll, we'll get to that, because it's, 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 a, it's, a it's, a, it's a tricky little thing. Um, so the basic idea is you go through and you develop and present a proposal, right? So there's an idea. Um, the next phase in consent is not engaging in the decision, but seeking clarification, right? Um, and you know, the question shouldn't be like, why is that idea so dumb, right? Like, the questions need to be like, really trying to really try to understand what the, um, you know, what the idea is, what the, you know, so it's, it's really factual, it's really focused. Um, and some people are gonna unearth their objections a little bit in their questions, right? It's not, you can't completely hide that. But the idea here is really not to kind of talk about the, you know, the merits of the proposal or the topic, but really try to understand the topic. And, and that's a really important thing of like, taking a step back and trying to understand, see it, right? That's a really important part of this process. Um, then you can do kind of a quick, brief response. How do we feel? Good, bad, right? How do we do it? And there's a tool we're gonna show in a little bit how you can do that real quick. Um, once you've kind of gotten a clear, a relatively clear picture, then you sort of go through this process really to unearth objections. And usually when you're trying to unearth objections, right, the way you do that is you don't say, who's got an objection to this? You go through and people are actually asked to, to name their objection one by one by one. Now in a room like this, that's really difficult. So you might have to break it up into smaller groups um, uh, or, um, you know, or do it over a longer period of time. Um, but the idea is to really like, kind of pull those things out. Um, then you resolve the objections, right? And then you make a decision and you implement and you evaluate. Now, Anybody who's ever been part of a difficult group decision is going to say, like, wait, so you unearth the objections and then you just resolve? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's easy. Like, so this, this, this where I'm sort of saying, like, yeah, this roadmap is cute and pretty and lovely um, and not realistic, right? The process of unearthing and resolving objections, that is really tricky. So let's talk about what that... Um, you know, one of the ways we do that. So, so one of the ways you can do that is doing this idea of rounds, right? And that's really, it's, it's structuring it, right? So the idea here is you've got this group of people, you've got an idea, and people ask the questions. They go around, right? Um, and everybody has, you know, has their turn, right? It's not like, oh, who's it? You're, it's really trying to get everybody to, to participate. Um, then you go through this idea of like, oh, I've got a reaction, I want to change this, you know, I love this, you know. Um, and then you go through this like consent round. Do I, you know, do I consent to this? Do I object to this or do I not object to this, right? So this is kind of like the idealized version of this. Um, this is a really powerful tool of how to get that, that big feedback, right? Um, so we call it, it's fist to five. Um, we didn't come up with this, but we call it fist to five. Some people don't call it fist to five. Um, but it's, what's great about it is it's done with just a hand. So if you have a hand, you can do it. Um, uh, 
and um, and you know, and like, and I'll just say, like, not everybody has hands, so like that actually is. I, I don't know what you do in like, you know, that's like an ableist like challenge. So you have to like work through it with that part, you know, with those with those folks. So if that's the, the reality in your organization, you have to, you know, this might not be the right choice. Um, but the idea here is you've got sort of these six points. You've got zero, right? And that's I block with major objections. I got a real problem with this, right? I'm giving that a zero, right? One is I've got a major issue that needs to be resolved, right? It's a big issue, right? Um, and it can't, it's, and it's like a big deal. We can't necessarily do with it right now. It's a big deal that has to be addressed. Two is it's a minor issue that needs to be resolved now, right? So it might not be like, you know, you know it might be like, like, okay, it's okay for us to go out to, you know, for everybody to, you know, to, um, you know, to bring in a food truck, but we need to make sure that there's enough food trucks so that people have you know, a variety of what they are, right? That might be a minor issue that can be resolved now, right? That's a, that's a two. If you're at zero, one, or two, if anybody is at those places, right? You don't have consent. You don't have agreement. There's, you, you, gotta, you gotta revisit, you gotta come back to that issue, you gotta deal with that issue, right? Um, a three, um, and I can't do three this way with my hand. Um, I can only do it this way. Um, uh, three is I've got like a little issue, but it, we, can, we can deal with it later, right? It doesn't, we don't need to stop it right now. Yes, it should be dealt with, but we're gonna deal with it later. Two or four is I support this with no objections, right? I don't have any, I don't have any problems. And five is like, I am the champion of this idea, right? They are a partner. Like if you're a five, you're like on board. And if you've got, if everybody's three or, you know, three, four or five, that's where you've got, con, you know, consent, right? And if everybody's a five, you've got consensus, right? Um, this is a really powerful thing because if we're looking at this room right here and we wanted to get an, in, you know, a, a, a sort of a vibe of where we were at around like, hey, um, you know, we've got this big water main break, and so we need to do this, and we think the idea here is that everybody's gonna, you know, get a, a, a little TV dinner and cook it in the microwave in their room. That's the idea. How do people feel about that? Like, where, you know, where, where are you at? Like, so that's the proposal, right? We're gonna do microwave dinners instead of going out to the restaurant. Um, how do people feel about that proposal on a fist of five? All right. We got some threes, we got some zeros, we got some ones, right? You get a really clear, but like, so right now, just in this little minute, we got a really pretty good idea of how, how the room feels about that, right? That's not a good, we can't move forward with that, right? So it becomes a quick way to do it, right? It, it matters why everybody feels differently about it, but at this stage, we know enough that we can't go forward with that idea because you've got a few people who are like, uh-uh, uh-uh, right? And if that's the case, you can like, move forward. Let's not spend 25 minutes debating like, well, should it be sofas or should it be this, right? We're not doing microwave dinners. Um, so let's focus on, you know, like, like that next step, right? And, that, and, it, and in a consensus model, oftentimes people will just be like, well, everybody needs to voice their view of how they, and you could just spend like hours and it's like, but we're not gonna do that. Why are we spending 30 minutes talking about this thing we know we're not gonna do? Because there's 12 people who are like a zero on this, right? Let's get, let's move on to try to get a solution that works for people. Um, so here's this idealized version, right? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the idea of like unearthing objections and resolving objections, right? So in an idealized, simple way, it's like, oh, you just identify them and then you resolve them but that's not really what it looks like, it's different, right? You're gonna go through these, all these different phases, right? There's all these like, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, if you have rules, that can help facilitate that process, right? So the rules of like how you manage that, that's like what the rounds can be, right? Um, you kind of break it up into these different pieces, right? And so this is just kind of an example of what a you know, process might look like. So you've got an idea, right? People ask these clarifying questions, right? Then you get to the reaction round, people react to it. Um, you get to the consent round, and you know, in this situation, it's like, oh, we made a decision, we've resolved those objections, and we've made a decision. But what happens if we can't resolve those objections, right? Well, then we kind of have to change the idea, 
right? And then we change the idea, you go back and do the clarifying questions again, right? And the process begins again, where you sort of move, th move through these, this process. Ideally, you get to a decision, but you might not get to a decision, right? And so then you do it again. Here's the different idea, right? And if you could do this quickly, right, it, 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 can, it can feel, you can make you know, progress and it can feel good. Sometimes you're like, okay, you've got a new idea and we need to do some of these clarifying questions. You need a break. We're not ready to make this decision in this room right now, right? We need to do some, some of our questions actually require some research. Some of our questions require us to like talk to somebody who's not in this room. Some of our questions require the people to really, you know, pencil out an idea. Um, so let's stop this meeting, <laughs> stop this part of this meeting, take a break and come back to it later, right? Um, and then you go through the process again. This idea, what it really is focusing you on is trying to get people to first understand through, um, you know, really first understand through those clarifying questions, what is, what are we really talking about? So that there's, there's a shared understanding. Um, then it's really getting like, okay, in that objection or in that consent round, there you're really trying to unearth like, do we have these, you know, do we have good ideas? right? Um, and how do we feel about it? This can be a process that if you practice it, right? So, I mean, I'll just warn everybody, you're going to go, um, you know, you're gonna, you know, you might be like, oh, this is great. I love this idea. Um, and you go back to your co-op and you say, let's do this. And it's going to be awkward and it's going to feel clunky and it's going to be like, well, that stunk. Um, because when you first try it, it's like not, it doesn't look like this, right? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not smooth, right? Some people are asking questions that are really objections. Some people, you know, you know, after some objections are raised, they start being like, wait, I have a question. It's not like, you know, it's not like a, a rigid, right? The rigidity of this is not the way, you know, it's not like, if I were to critique kind of some of the sociocracy or holacracy or some of these other systems that are out there that use consent, it's like a rigidity in kind of how they're described. Your system for your co-op is gonna be your system for your co-op and it's gonna be based upon who the people in that you know, room are. If you've got a room full of like opinionated loudmouths, then you really need to facilitate in a way that like, like gets people to slow down and listen. If you've got a room, like, you know, a room full of people who are like really quiet, you really need to facilitate in a way that really tries to extract ideas. And if you have a room with some people who are really quiet and some people who are really loud, you have to figure out how to facilitate the process to, 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 you know, um, uh, to make you know, all those voices be heard. That is a skill, facilitating, being a good facilitator. So I am not a good facilitator because I'm a loud mouth. Being a good facilitator is a skill and it is a thing that takes a lot of time and deliberation and energy to do it. When you have a good facilitator, kind of when, when that's a skill that a lot of people have in the organization and you're using that and you're using these rules, you can have these like really fantastic meetings where people disagree. It's like, I was mad and I'm so glad that we went through that process because now we understand each other and we agree with this decision and it's our collective decision and we're gonna move forward. It can be really a powerful thing, right? To build unanimity, to build a shared agreement, a, real, a shared understanding, that can be an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and when you have these tools and you use them properly, you're gonna find that some people who are you know, really kind of aggressive and loud, they can kind of step back, right? And all of a sudden, they're just such a better person to have in a meeting. And you get the people who are quiet and they're stepping in and they're just such a better person to have in a meeting, right? You, it can be a way where people can be kind of their full true self. And that is a really wonderful and powerful thing. Um, so it's not just like efficient, it actually is something I think changes how we interact with each other and it changes those power dynamics. And by changing those power dynamics, it kind of creates 
a more shared power, and that shared power is actually what cooperatives, why they're powerful. Um, so it makes your, you know, it can make your, your, your co-op more powerful. Um, so that's where we're at. I think I only went three minutes over, which is amazing, but I'm going to say um, if there are questions or reactions or anything like that, maybe we could take a couple minutes for those. So in the back. Could not have said that better. That is like, yeah, absolutely. To, to just to lift up one of those one of the points there, sociocracy is a really wonderful and amazing. Um, uh, there is a really shared community um, in there, and so there's a lot of resources, right? So even if it's not like the system isn't for you, right? There's enormous amount of resources in you know that are out there, and there's a real community. So there's like sociocracy for all, round sky solutions, um, management 3.0. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of of, and there's lots of free resources. There's trainings. Um, uh, and it's a, you know, it's a really, it's, it, is a, it is a really vibrant community and there's a lot of cooperatives in that community. Um, and so from that perspective, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it, it, is, a, it is a welcoming and, and, and engaging place. So I um, uh, uh, would encourage folks to, to, to look into that. Um, so. Decided at different levels of how to make it a 
a real process, you know, like how you can like structure, how you can use consent at different levels and with, with clarity also. Yeah, so, so the question is how do you use, um, uh, I should repeat the question, right, for the online, okay. Um, so the question is, how do you um, can use some of these tools, especially when you've got um, sort of different, you know, different groups um, who have different authority in um, the uh, within the organization? So I'm going to make another plug for an ICA resource around democratic governance. So we have a, um, a publication and some tools around this, which really lays out um, kind of. There's, you know, in your cooperative or even in, you know, in, any, in a nonprofit or in any really organization, you know, you've got your, the membership, right, or in a worker co-op, the staff, the membership, you've got your board of directors and you've got the management or leadership. It's really critically important to understand what is the authority and the sort of the scope of each of those different groups. So understanding who they are and what they do and then how do you make these decisions? And so we actually, this tool that we have, it basically, there's, there's three tests, I'm only gonna talk about two of them. One of them is about, it's, we call it the extensiveness test, um, and then the other is the significance test. And they're really sort of tools really designed to help people understand, is this the decision that the membership um, should be consulted around? Is this the decision that the board should be consulted around? Um, and what we recommend folks do is you actually go through and you sort of, you know, it's like, so, you know, if it affects, right, like it affects the, the nature of the business, right, the membership should be consulted, right? If it affects the, you know, the organization for a really long time, the membership should be consulted. If it affects the, um, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, key things around payroll or not payroll, but around pay or, or working conditions, the membership should be consulted, right? Um, there's an example of a really great co-op business, new manager, new CEO came in, looked at this division, said, that division doesn't make any money. That division is a drag on this business and shut it down, laid it off, fired, you know, six or seven people, made more money for the business. Right? Everybody was mad because that part of the business was like part of the soul of the business, right? Like it lost money, but it was really important to the organization, right? That manager made a decision that affected the very character of the business without consulting the membership. That's a violation of democratic governance, right? So understanding what's the what's for a you know for for the board, what's for membership, what's for managers, and how do you do that, like how do you lay that out? Right? So that's really coming up with um, policies and procedures, right? Where, and we, you know, we sort of recommend folks come up with actual like charts and you know, like this is where you're, you know, who decides, who advises, who prepares, you know, who's consulted um, uh, for each of these kind of different um, decision-making things. And then you might say, you know, hey, consent is, you know, if, if, you're, if your room, you know, if it's a room like this, Right, and you want to do, you know, like consent might be really tricky, um, uh, especially or to using rounds might be really tricky. And so you might decide, like, you know what, we're not going to do rounds in this way. We're going to do small groups, and we're going to break up this way. Um, but you have these sort of, you know, like you may, you've got in these, you know, these tests and these rules. It's sort of like this is a decision that the membership needs to be engaged around. So we need to develop a mechanism that allows us to engage the membership where it's easier to make decisions, the smaller the group is. Um, and so the tools, how you're gonna employ these tools and these rules is gonna, is gonna change. But really mapping out like what's for these different groups is, is really, you know, is, is probably the, the foundation for being able to, um, you know, implement these tools in that. So I think at that we probably have to stop. So. Thank you.